Okay. Hello, everybody, and good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you are. I'm Monica Marshall. I head up a practice at a global I will be the moderator for this panel, which is focused on the pace of change taking place all around us as a result of the COVID shock and how trust and integrity, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> have become so integral to how we're all surviving and what we need to do to actually thrive and manage through COVID. Today, we have several uh, distinguished leaders who will discuss the risks they are seeing at the top of the global agenda from climate and health to cyber and beyond, and how leaders can best guide their institutions and countries to manage the risks. We'll look at the interconnectedness of these risks in this heightened political, economic, and social uncertainty. So today we have Esco Ajo, who is the chairman of the board of ADVIN and the former prime minister of Finland. We have Dr. Jayshree Panda, a leading expert at the intersection of science, technology, and security. She's also the founder and chief executive officer of Risk Group, an award-winning scientist and a futurist passionate about protecting the future of humanity. I just love that part of your bio, <laughs> Jayshree. We have Pasquale Siegel, a managing director in the geopolitical intelligence practice at Ancora. Ancora is an international business management consulting firm, and Pasquale's practice helps clients navigate geopolitical uncertainties by identifying and mitigating risks and recognizing and leveraging opportunities. We have Abhi Shaw, the founder and former CEO of an AI-powered analytics firm called The Clutch Group. He's a Harvard MBA and was named Entrepreneur of the Year by EY, along with a whole long list of other accolades as a, as a young entrepreneur and young CEO. Abhi currently serves on the boards of a digital transformation provider, Moray Global Corporation, and is also the chairman of UVA, an NGO that has transformed 1,800 plus impoverished municipal schools impacting the lives of over 800,000 um, underserved children. And from Saudi Arabia, we have Abdul Aziz al -Bakr. He's the chairman of business management technology, a social entrepreneur with vast experience in IT and digital transformation. He has successfully managed some very high profile automation projects and has also received Young CEO uh, of the Year Award. So we have 40 minutes this morning. I do encourage questions and I will be checking the chat box. So feel free to drop them in. But we thought we would set the stage with a high level view of the risks and challenges that we're facing. So let's just jump right in with you, Esco, your, your amazing experience and insights on how to identify and manage risks makes you uniquely suited to kick this conversation off. What are you seeing as the most pressing risks facing governments and organizations this year? Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to join this uh, distinguished panel. And uh, unfortunately, my my uh, video is a bit frozen, like this background as well. So, so for some reasons, uh, uh, this is line is not working perfectly. But but hopefully, you can you can hear me well, so that I'm, I'm getting my ideas. True. So first of all, um, I think it's very important to understand that uh, crisis, a crisis always includes two phases. That phase, uh, that means uh, destruction, and uh, good phase, optimistic phase, including opportunities to, to transformation. And uh, I don't expect that this COVID crisis will be different. We have seen now this uh, health crisis with its consequences. Unfortunately, I'm pessimistic that in spite of the fact that vaccinations will expand rapidly and execution will be faster in the future, 
I don't expect that we are getting rid of this uh, uh, pandemia within a short period of time. We have to learn to live with this uh, a bit longer. But anyway, uh, in the same time, we have seen early indications uh, what kind of uh, transformation processes are going on. If you look at, for example, digitalization, uh, we have taken uh, very fast steps and long steps in a short period of time and uh, started to use both in business life but in, in governmental roles, in private life as well, these modern technological tools in a much more efficient way. There is no way back. I think this is a new normal we are going to stay, stay here. Remote working has increased in a way which is unprecedented. No one was able to, to expect that this kind of working method will be able to be used and it is going to be as efficient as it is today. And also uh, uh, online sales have increased. We are not returning back to the same business model we, we used before this crisis. So um, all in all, I think we, we are facing huge challenges, huge problems, but we have also uh, substantial new opportunities. Um, may I use a couple of uh, additional words or, or mm -hmm. do you want to me, to me stop here? You know, no, I think you can add, it would be really, um, you know, given your experience as being a former prime minister and understanding how to look far ahead and, and, and see the macro issues, but, but manage very locally because you needed to provide, you know, um, security to your constituents. How do you see that different um, now with COVID or not? Or in your experience, have you, have you seen, have you learned some techniques that you can share on how, how other people can manage the macro and the micro when it comes to risks? These uh, crisis situations requi require exceptional decision-making methods, both uh, uh, in the public but in the private sector as, as well. And uh, especially uh, on the public side, I think our decision-making systems are extremely old-fashioned. We have still these silos, uh, ministries, uh, authorities divided into groups of specialists. And uh, I don't believe that this is the right method not to meet the challenge of the virus and this crisis. of uh, issues is going to get more and more critical. How to integrate new technologies, new business models, uh, how, to, how to get also a maximum out of, uh, of, uh, of uh, business and government collaboration in many fields. I, I think this is extremely important. And that's yeah, why you know, both in companies and governments, both in com companies and governments, you have to be able to create more integrated decision making, and that means conceptual decision making. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Jay Shree, I know that this is an area that's close to you. We've, when we were preparing for this conversation, you were very passionate about people understanding the interconnectedness between the risks, and and that those, that interconnectedness requires a different kind of leadership. Do you want to talk a little bit about your um, thoughts on that? Sure. You know, thank you so much for asking me that question because understanding the interconnectedness of the major risk is so very important, especially when we are going through the pandemic. It is not just a disease that has hit, you know, the human species. It's We cannot look at it that way. It is much more complex than that because... The reason is everyone and everything is interconnected. So just like our human cells physiology is connected to the physiology of the cosmos, everything is connected. Therefore, understanding the why, how, when, and what of the global pandemic 
requires us to understand and evaluate the core of the human domains dimensions and ecosystem it is not just a disease it is much more complex than that human species is going through an evolutionary moment so amidst this ongoing pandemic and the human health crisis the lockdowns the supply chain disruptions the digital disorders emerging technologies and the existential risk that we face it seems the principles on which the existing systems and theories are based are proving very ineffective the reason is for the last century we have relied heavily on darwinism that means that irrespective of biological species the one who is fit survives and the failed one disappears that is the concept the survival of the fittest concept that is applied everywhere in our systems and models beyond biology in computing in economics and how we manage our risk as well but today quantum physics the study of the universe on an atomic scale gives us a reference model to understand how everything is connected it helps us understand how individual human behavior impacts collective systems and the security of humanity now since what happens in our ecosystem is the aggregate of all living beings physiology not just mine or yours yours or you know anybody else but everyone's physiology our systems and models must comply with laws of nature so it is time to move our systems beyond natural selection to symbiosis to mutualism to mutualistic ngio symbiosis ngio means nations its government industries organizations and academia so it is time that we evolve everything and everywhere mhm mm so pascal um you know understanding the interconnectedness and being able to really look at the macro and the micro how do organizations how do leaders um manage risk So for, first of all thank you for having me on the panel it's a pleasure to to talk to you um so you know we're facing mounting risks we are these risks are more interconnected and there is even another layer of complexity which is the multilateral system that we use to manage those risks you know is fraying to to say the least and geopolitical uh rivalry is intensifying um so that itself generates additional risks uh into the system um to survive companies have to rethink how they manage political risk and geopolitical risk um traditionally companies tend to form you know specific risks to specific corporate functions you know government relations is going to monitor policy and regulatory risk legal is going to take care of compliance finance is going to take care of uh foreign exchange um hedging but that's that's not good enough now if i mean to face these you know systemic risks companies are going to have to manage risk in a more systemic and holistic um manner um and that um in a in a system of system you know kind of thinking um that means being able to look and to manage risk across time of, you know time horizons you know short term mid term and long term um that means looking at risk across all the functions including strategy you know very um very often when when we get a call um you know from a company it's because oh, they have a project next year you know how do they manage what's the risk situation in this country where they want to go um but they are you can tell them okay yes the risk is this now but think about how it will reverberate you know 3 years or 5 years down the line and that that kind of long term thinking is very hard for a company 
to to do, except maybe for the energy companies because they have, you know, because of where oil is in general or, or natural gas. Um, and it is also they also need to look at at risk across um, all the region. You know what happens here can reverberate reverberate there. Um, I think it's it's also time for for companies to re to rethink how they adapt to um, high impact, low probability scenarios. Um, it's very interesting if you, if you go read the 10K declaration of, of major um, companies in, in the US, many of them actually mention the risk of a pandemic, but they didn't do much about it and didn't really prepare. Um, so the, that needs, that also probably needs to change. Well, you know, it's interesting you bring that up. Um, the conference board just uh, released a study about a month ago of um, CEOs where they looked at all of the risks that are, you know, high impact, high probability, low impact, low probability. And as I'm sure everybody has seen, the world is focused, for example, on climate change as a, as a you know, eminent risk that we need to really address collectively. And in that, and you have lots of companies coming out and making statements about how they're going to address climate change. It's the number one threat to their business, blah, blah. Um, yet, when you actually look at the, the, their views on how, um, you know, on whether this is an immediate risk, it's not. They they're say saying no. it's, a, it's a low, you know, probability, low impact risk. So I want to put you on the spot. Uh, Pasquale, and ask you, apart from the energy companies, which would be a whole nother panel discussion, I think, are there any companies that you see, and you might not be able to name it by name, but any companies that you see doing this really well, and is there any learning from that that you might be able to share? Um, well, I cannot, you know, name um, name companies, obviously, but um, uh, I would have, I mean, I would have to say that the companies that do this best um, are actually the energy companies, and um, because they have a lo they have a long track record. They're, yeah, they have a long track record of of doing this, and and okay, I will go with the public information on this, of course, but Shell, um, you know, back. I don't know, by, I think it's maybe 20 years, um, pioneered um, the, you know, the alternative scenario uh, methodology. But you can also look at a company like Equinor, for example, that does a really good job um, <clears throat> at forecasting, you know, saying, okay, here is, you know, here is a baseline scenario, here is the upside, here is the downside. And looking at, you know, uh, short term, mid term, long term um, uh, scenarios. Um, I think I think they are still really the best at at doing this. You have other companies that, or or other industrial sectors, let's say, um, that are not. Um, that do not think by and large that geopolitical risk applies to to them because they view themselves as a force of good. I would, right. you know, technology companies, for example, mm -hmm. um, have this, you know, idea of their mission in the world and don't really do not invest as much in managing their geopolitical yeah. risk. Yeah, and the, I know. Well, Abby, it's not all bad news because there are solutions and the role of technology can be good and bad, we know. Um, tell us a little bit about your thoughts on, given your experience, both working in, you know, for profit, but also running, you know, an NGO um, about the some of the solutions you see to some of these risks and some best practices. Well, thanks, Monica. Um 
You know, we're up to 121 million cases now as of this morning, 2.7 million deaths, record unemployment, 20 trillion global bailouts so far and counting. So, you know, although Pascal says that uh, some companies put it in their 10Ks, the risk of a pandemic, I mean, the sheer magnitude and the impact um, and the speed at which which it has happened has really exposed how unprepared and fragile our institutions and our nations really are. And with this, you know, once in a century black swan event, there is heightened uncertainty. And I, I believe, you know, the solution, the way forward, or as ESCO says, the second phase of transformation, you know, really is to reimagine and rebuild with resilience. And what I mean by that is to take the painful lessons that have emanated from COVID and turn them into effective solutions that we can use to rebuild our lives, our livelihoods, our institutions, and our nations, not only with the resilience to absorb future shocks, but to rebuild a more inclusive economy and society. And so, you know, you asked about digitization, and ESCO mentioned it at the beginning, when customers are increasingly buying digitally, employees are working remotely, companies are improving uh, their operations with artificial intelligence. And uh, we may have leapfrogged five to seven years in digital adoption just in the last year. Uh, you know, companies like Facebook are shifting 50% of their employees to remote working in five to 10 years. TCS with 450,000 employees are doing it within five years. Um, and U.S. productivity in quarter two was up 10.6%. And in quarter three of last year was up another 4.6% on top of that. So I wholeheartedly agree, um, you know, with ESCO that we're not going back to normal. We're moving forward to a new normal in a brave new digital world. And so, again, with the theme of sort of reimagining and rebuilding, we will need to reimagine and rebuild a future with leaner organizations, rise in a flexible remote workforce, reskilling and upskilling these people to meet the higher digital skills demand. And it's going to be challenging. Look, I mean, this may come as a surprise, but uh, half the world is still offline. And and that that's about four out of five people in developing countries. So, um, you know, it, it's going to require some real leadership uh, in, in the new normal. Uh, let's take another example of healthcare. You know, it has changed substantially with biology meeting technology in new ways. Uh, and it has really come to life in telehealth and biopharma over the last year. I mean, the COVID-19 genome was sequenced in just a matter of weeks and the vaccine was rolled out in less than a year. I mean, if you think about it, it's an incredible accomplishment given that it has often taken a decade uh, to develop and roll out a vaccine. So if, if these lessons uh, are applied, uh, if we reimagine using these lessons, you know, what impact can be had on other diseases? Just think about what a significant role they can play in faster development of treatments. Um, you know, and, and certainly uh, many reforms are required. You know, this is not just for businesses, but for nations as well to think about how do we really mitigate or preempt a future health crisis? You know, how do we restrict those factors that made it a global phenomenon and, and limit it to a local issue, um, you know, to begin with? How do we upgrade the health infrastructure and modernize it to meet such a rapid rise that we saw in patient volumes? So I, for one, am cautiously optimistic and believe that strong leaders both from businesses and governments, we can reimagine and rebuild a better world that's more resilient and more inclusive uh, than the past. It's a perfect segue to um, Abdulaziz al Bakr because um, I was going to ask him really, with everything going on, with the silos, you know, that we've just heard about, with you know the, you know, all of the risks that that we're faced with, how should leaders lead? How do leaders learn to lead? What are some ways that leaders can lead, continue to lead through this? 
Well, uh, looking at everything that has happened, a lot of things have broken. Uh, operating models have broken. Supply chains have broken. Things we we used to uh, build or structure around it, like uh, efficiency, it doesn't apply in these areas. So leaders are faced with uh, with certain challenges. They have to balance between paradox. Uh, so am you I gonna, did, you, did you ask me? Uh, uh, are oh. we going to be uh, uh, balanced between efficiency and resilience? Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Abd uh, yeah. Abdulaziz is still speaking, Esco. I think you're breaking up just a little bit. Yeah. No, sorry. So, sorry because uh, I, I didn't hear anything. Oh. That's the so, role of technology. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's one of the things. That, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, we get uh, dependent on the technology. So going back, uh, the leaders have to choose efficiency versus resilience. Like if we look at the hierarchy of the organization, If I need to make a fast decision, I can't go through this rigid hierarchy of the organization. So what I need to do is empower and do more of a scenario planning, which is, let's say, uh, a plan uh, and a, uh, uh, make it an adaptive planning, short planning and avoid the long-term planning because you're not sure what's going to happen. We need to do to re, to recover. We need to solve the problems that we have right now. So, uh, adopt agile planning in that uh, in that sense, uh, so that you continue build based and plan based on what you know, what do you have, what can we do to recover, as and then once you get more information, and then continue doing it. And then adopt also try to use option planning for different parts of your business or different parts of uh, the, even if it's a public sector. This way, I think it will be much more easier for leaders. Another thing that is very important is the communication. Leaders have to be straightforward and uh, let's say just Whatever I know as a leader, I have to make sure that everybody else knows it. Because when this pandemic uh, is finished, everybody is going to look back on dis the decisions you made and how you communicated to your people. What did you do to protect your people? And that might bite uh, some companies that made bad decisions and were not effective in their communication. They, uh, you have to say the truth, whether it's ugly or not. That's a very important thing. And you have to show how you can manage with your people and be agile. Uh, at the end, uh, these are the resources that you have. And you have to recover and try to make the best out of it until we reach, uh, uh, let's say, sure uh, after this uh, pandemic. Well, we, the, you know, so the communications component as a comms person near and dear to my heart, I, I do have to say I've been very impressed. It took some companies a while to figure out how to communicate, but I've been pretty impressed with how um, companies have been really taking care of their employees. But, um, you know, we all have very short memories. So I love your point about agile, being agile, and the point, Abdi, when you talked about how quickly the vaccines came out. And then, you know, Pasquale, you know, the energy companies are really ahead of the game. Well, these are all instances where it was like you either do it or you die or you go away. Or, absolutely. So we have short memories. Do we think that we're going to keep some of these learnings and the leadership, whether it's in government or private sector, um, will really take this in, into account and bring some of these learnings into their organizations? Or do we feel like, okay, once we get through this, we're going to go back to old ways? I don't know if anybody, uh, of the six of you have an opinion about that or an example that you want to bring, bring up. 
Okay, I'm putting you all in the spot. May I start? <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Well, I I think that uh, yeah, I I think it's uh, it's a problem that when the crisis hits, we don't fully understand why we are there, what are the origins, and what are the real reasons for the crisis. And then when crisis is over, we don't fully understand why economy and society is recovering so fast. So so mm -hmm. this analysis of crisis is something we, we should concentrate in research much, much more that, than what we have been doing. And secondly, um, I think it's closely linked to this business and government aspect. Uh, earlier, uh, when economies were based on traditional manufacturing and industries, business and government worked a lot uh, together. So that it was rather easy to understand the logic of business on the political side and the logic of uh, politics on the business side. But now I'm afraid that this link is not very clear anymore. And we have seen already that there are a lot of challenges now for business leaders to to understand how the politics works. And they, they don't even care about about politics that much anymore. <laughs> and on the political side, we have rather simple understanding and simple solutions provided for business leaders, what, what to do. Politicians believe that they know business better than businessmen themselves. I, I think we have to create better understanding of, of the logic, which is different. And these two different logics have to be integrated into, into one. And finally, this social media, which yeah. is a fantastic thing. Yeah. But in my opinion, we have got much, much more data and less and less understanding. Mm -hmm. This is a paradox of today. <laughs> yeah, so you bring up an interesting point that, you know, I, when I worked at the UN for 10 years and I used to always say we all spoke English, but we spoke completely different languages because I came from a private sector mentality, trying to deal with companies inside this big organization. COVID had, has forced business and governments to work together, but at a time where there's a, there really is a lack of trust amongst all of the players. Yet, some good things have come out of it, um, and I'd be pointing to, you know, a few of them. Do we, do we see in this, you know, again, having a having, um, short uh, memory span here, do we see, these, do we see business and, organ and uh, governments building more trust together? Because it's, I think it's paramount to any kind of recovery and honestly, any kind of learning. We need to lean in to be able to accept our faults and we need to lean in to be able to accept other points of view. So we might not all speak English, but we, we might not all speak, uh, we might all speak English, but not the same language, but we need to learn how to do that. Any thoughts from the panelists? If I may. To establish trust, we need systems that are interconnected and that allows us to share our information, our intelligence that we have. So if we talk about, uh, you know, what Pascal was talking about, you know, how to, uh, about the interconnect, the risk that we are identifying and, you know, how to identify them and how to manage those risks. One thing I have noticed is that we just don't have systems that will allow us to identify the risk in a timely manner and share that information intelligence to the decision makers. If there are two kinds of risk, independent risk and interconnected interdependent risk. If we see everyone is so focused on managing their independent risk in silo, even if they identify the interconnected risk that would, you know, impact other organizations, their countries or the other countries, you know, there is just no flow of the information of those interconnected risks because we do not have the systems. So unless we establish effective systems, we will not be able to bring the trust back into the society because we we are all focused on managing our own silo independent risk. And we are not bothered about what is happening to others or what is happening to the interconnected risk or we are not even identifying the interconnected risk. So we have to build inclusive governance models. I mean, as a species, we have made a great progress and we have explored 
the unknowns beyond the our ecosystem of geospace and we have moved to cyberspace now we are moving to quantum space and space and we are shaping the course of our human evolution but we cannot do that we cannot continue to do that unless and until we establish effective systems that will help us reestablish the trust that we need as a society as a collective you know human species i yeah. think um monica can i add something here Absolutely. um i think the um this is right you know about the lack of institutions um that enable us to to manage those risks in the short term the only response is through more you know cooperation i mean you know bilateral multilateral cooperation more consultation more talking more compromise um you know to rebuild to start rebuilding the the trust and from that we can hope that you know governing mechanisms um better governing me- mechanisms will will emerge but it has to start at the grassroots level it's not going to come from the top because there is no agreement you know at the top um so we have just two minutes left before we get cut off um I think you know understanding being able to understand and identify the risk understand and and make sure that the interconnectedness is clear and build the systems does anybody have for the for the folks on the line does anybody have one or two points that are very concrete ways that that our listeners can take away from this on how they might be able to be better leaders through this so I'm going to steal something from Abdul Aziz because it's something near and dear to my heart is humble communications. No one knows everything. So don't be afraid to to lead, to talk about what you might not know. I think it's a huge reputation driver. No one knows all the answers. That's my piece of advice. Any other thoughts? I'll add two points which is uh, transparency and trust. create that trust between uh, teams between the whole organization between your organization and the society and this way we can build a better uh, uh, path for recovery for the whole or uh, not only just the organization but also the society and the community yeah i would add one up sorry i i would add one it's active listening yeah nobody knows everything so ask questions ask questions first and listen mhm i i wholeheartedly agree i think transparency trust and listening are critical and i'd add one more to that uh monica which is you know being flexible and being adaptable uh we have experienced how rapid uh, uh change era that we are living in you know and how fast moving and fast evolving things are and so as jashri started quoting <clears throat> charles darwin you know i i pick another saying from him that it's not the strongest of the species that survives uh nor is it the most intelligent that survives it is the one that is most adaptable to change mm-hmm. uh yeah. you know and i think that's going to be critical for leaders going forward yep Yes, may, I add one, may I add one aspect? I, I, I will return back to this conceptual thinking. I, I think I agree. No one is able to know everything, and uh, and it's mission impossible. But good leader always has a concept, and without concept, you cannot you cannot lead. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes and I would I, I would add that the road to solving most problems today goes through cyberspace so we have to innovate 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 Excellent Well thank you all very much this has been a great uh kick off to my day and um I hope all of our uh listeners um learn some things but if you have any follow up questions that uh you have please reach out to any of us I think you have all of our contact information but um I hope everybody has a great day and it's been really fantastic getting to know all of you um and having this conversation
It's been Thank a pleasure. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.